Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. I know people are still coming in, so we'll just keep admitting all of you as we go along. Uh, my name is Amy Bowie, and I am the librarian for the Honors College, the EIS program in the Philosophy and Classics Department. Um, happy Lunar New Year's Eve to those of you who celebrate. Um, I will go ahead and let my co-host, uh, Diane, introduce herself now. Oh, yeah, we're, we're co-hosting, so, yes. so go ahead, Diane. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Diane Lopez. I am the librarian for Counseling, Social Work, Demography, and the College of Architecture, Construction, and Planning. And I'm really excited for today's event and to hear the like experiences of women in STEMs, which is always such a like wonderful thing to hear about that, you know, the, the progress that we do and the work that we do. Yes, so we also have um, Esteban and Matt today. They'll be moderating chat and just managing the tech for us. It, the weather outside is really bad right now. So we were just saying earlier, if anyone's <laughs> internet cuts out, uh, we might just disappear for a second, but we'll keep on going. So please bear with us. Um, but yeah, we have a wonderful faculty panel gathered here for you today. So we're gonna go ahead and just let them introduce themselves. Um, so Dr. Vikaslin, would you like to go first? Sure, I'm happy to. And you can all hear me okay, right? Just to make sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I finished a PhD in chemistry at the University of Washington in Seattle. So this weather is very comforting and homey to me. I am savoring our three days of winter. Uh, I finished that in March, 2009. And I think it's um, maybe worth noting or interesting. I had my first daughter in September, 2008. So she was very young as I wrote a dissertation and defended it. I don't really remember any of that six months or so of my life. Um, I had a publication that was accepted um, and officially submitted the day she was born. So that may be one of my bigger claims to fame in STEM. Um, I worked in curriculum writing and editing for several years. Um, and then I taught in the biomedical engineering department at Washington University in St. Louis. So not University of Washington, Washington University, just to be clear. Um, I also taught secondary science for a few years, and this is my second year at UTSA teaching um, in the AIS department, which I have loved, and I really love working with UTSA students in teaching a bunch of places. Um, I am 100% sure UTSA students have been the best students that I've worked with. That's me, happy to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Bikaslin. Um, Dr. B, would you like to go next? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Kiran Bhaganagar. I'm currently an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. So I grew up in India, South India, and uh, I did my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. So when I joined my bachelor's there, 15% uh, of the students were women. However, um, in mechanical engineering, I happen to be the only woman in my class. So at that time, I thought it was, uh, it was quite odd. But then later on, I realized that has been the theme of my life most of the time. <laughs> so then I came to United States. Um, I went to University of Cincinnati and then Cornell University and UCLA for my master's, PhD, and postdoctoral research. And uh, it was a very great learning experience. Um, I have learned a lot about the culture um, being in Ohio, Ithaca, Los Angeles, three different cultures. It was very, uh, it was a very exciting time. And I was also very fortunate that um, uh, all my experiences have been so promising that uh, it gave me a momentum to keep going. So then later on, I joined um, UTSA. And um, just uh, as uh, Dr. Waxland has mentioned, I joined in 2009, uh, 10, and um, I my first class was I had a big tummy and I had my first baby at the same time, who is now 10 years old. So um, it was interesting. I was teaching and my students would always say, oh, is it going to be a classroom to the delivery room? And they would always be waiting. Is it the time? And <laughs> so the semester ended in December and uh, my son was born January 10th. So you know how close it was. <laughs> and, so uh, currently I am in, I teach fluid dynamics um, and uh, I am actively involved in a lot of uh, active research with uh, Army, Navy, uh, US Coast Guard, NASA. So that's an exciting stuff uh, in terms of research that's going on. So that's uh, 
overall about me and I'm very happy to be here uh, with all the other colleagues and also with so many of you to share our experiences. So nice to be here and thanks for organizing it. Thank you, Dr. B. And um, Dr. Bush, how about you go next? Okay, I'm Janice Bush. I'm the chair of the Department of Environmental Science and Ecology here at UTSA. I'm a professor of plant ecology. And right now I'm also serving as associate dean graduate studies in the College of Sciences. I'm actually a native San Antonian. Uh, so I moved here when I was about five years old. I also an alumni, uh, alumnus twice at UTSA. I got my uh, bachelor's degree in 1981. So you realize the university was just getting started and my master's in 1984. My doctorate's in environmental science and ecology, uh, and env uh, environmental science and engineering, excuse me, from UTEP. So a couple of my most recent accomplishments, I led uh, the state uh, efforts on studying the monarch butterfly, determining the status of the monarch butterfly uh, as it travels through here, uh, going in to Canada and back home to Mexico and the milkweeds. And uh, so the species is declining. And so uh, the state wants to make sure it's part of the solution and not part of the problem. Another project I'm really excited about that you can see in my background here is the new Cypress Living Laboratory. Uh, the funds were secured from the Prop 1, which is protection of the Edwards Aquifer through the city of San Antonio. And we're gonna use this as an outreach building. And so it's being constructed right now. So I'm hoping, uh, this fall, we'll be able to start bringing school kids out and teach them about the importance of water and uh, the Edwards Aquifer. So um, I really want to thank the library staff for putting on this event today. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, and finally, Dr. Espy, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here and to speak with you all. Uh, I am uh, Kimberly Aspey. I serve as your provost. I've been here at UTSA. This is my third year. A provost is the chief academic officer. I'm a, a clinical neuroscientist by training. I'm a Peter uh, Flan distinguished professor. I study how um, the brains in young children, how they learn, how they think, and how that goes off track with different medical conditions. Um, and I've studied this two cohorts of children for the last, oh, it makes me sound so old, about 20 years now that, and they're actually now at the cusp of adulthood so it's a real pleasure to be able to impact the work um, continuously regardless of it at which place you sit in an institution um, it's funny to hear y'all's story about you know having children in graduate school and and the challenges that that faced in some ways it's remarkable to me the same challenges that i faced or what you all experienced some um, decade two decades afterwards right and I think we have a fair bit of um, ground still, still to cover ahead um, as women in STEM. So thank you all. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a very wide range of fields covered here today, which I am so excited about. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and ask our first question. Um, so I'll um, direct this to you, Dr. Bush, but everyone else can feel free to chime in if you, um, if you have anything more to add. Um, so how, um, how and why did you become interested in your particular field or in STEM in general? Yeah, so my first conscious decision regarding choosing, choosing science that the, uh, probably occurred at the end of my sophomore year in high school when you had to pick your classes for your uh, next year. At the time, only two years of science and math were required. Uh, to graduate, and um, I, I took science and math in all four years uh, because I knew I wanted to be a scientist. And that's really the first conscious, as I go back and think about things, that was my first conscious decision uh, to become a scientist. But I really, I didn't know what that meant. So I decided I'm going to be a pharmacist because I knew pharmacy was related to science and so I'll be a pharmacist, but I was really naive. I did not have any science role models whatsoever. Um, I was raised in a musical family, and so I'm a much more natural musician than a scientist, uh, but I always loved science. So my mom tells the stories of reading books about insects to me when I was real little. Uh, I don't remember it specifically, the topic, but I, of course, remember her reading to me. And, um, and I also remember writing a letter to uh, the, the Craigheads after I saw a PBS show on grizzly bears. 
And I must have been like seven or eight. And I wrote him a letter. I don't remember what the letter said, but I wrote him a letter about, you know, the grizzly bears. So, and uh, then I always spent a lot of time outside with my brother, uh, walking in the woods and things like that. But I really had no idea that I could link this natural love for nature with my love for science that I learned in school until probably a junior in university. It, it wasn't until about my, probably after my junior year, you start taking electives. Um, so I didn't know you could be like a plant ecologist and study trees and be outside. Uh, so for me, uh, the why is something that I think was just really kind of inherited, you know, and in, in, in something in my brain, <laughs> maybe Dr. Espy can figure it out. <laughs> uh, and it, it was expressed very early, those interested interests. But um, so when, you know, there are a couple of critical steps, I think, along my pathway, uh, where I made some conscious decisions and learned more uh, to express my my love and desire for the sciences. And why, you know, I just think it's it's a part of who I am. It's it's my character. So it, it's it'll be interesting to see what the other panelists how they came to it. But that that's kind of my story, how I got where I am. No, that is a wonderful start to a story. I I, I always think the same, like those childhood passions and how they develop into what we decide to be and who we decide to become in our future. Uh, Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Bush, for sharing that story. Uh, our second question that we have is for Dr. Espy. Um, what were some challenges um, you faced in, STEM, in the STEM field and how were you able to overcome these challenges that were, you know, these obstacles and barriers to your journey? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I am muted, in fact. Sorry about that. So I, I'm happy to take that question, perhaps as one at the more senior part of their career. You know, it, it, it's interesting to me that the kind of challenges you face, some big and some small, but oftentimes it's those small kind of accumulated things that are, are, are challenging to handle. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was um, a, a new, I'd taken a new faculty position through kind of a tortuous and twisty course and we had a new department chair who was coming from the outside. And so he was meeting with all the new faculty, you know, and you're just starting and you're nervous and, you know, you're trying to impress him of, you know, what you're doing and what you're excited about and the impact that you had. And um, my husband um, was in the department at the time doing some kind of different things. And, you know, this guy's brand new. He's coming from Vanderbilt. I was at University of Arizona at the time, my first time at University of Arizona. And he meets with us, each of us individually. And literally the first thing out of his mouth is, well, who's at home taking your children, taking care of your children. And you know, at the time you're just like, blah, 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 right. And you know, and in some ways you could say, well, maybe he was concerned. He knew my husband was in the department. And I think then I had four children and you know, maybe he was just curious, but you know, even if that was the intent, it just has this way of taking a knife and sticking it in the middle of your heart, right? And it's those little comments and little things that are challenging in, in the everyday. Often it isn't a big event that's discriminatory or it's those little things that are just challenging. And I must say across my career, I've gotten much better at just letting that stuff roll off your back and saying, hey, what do they know? They don't know anything, right? That those kind of comments are motivated by their own ignorance, not about anything with in yourself. But I must say at the time, that isn't how I felt. I felt like, oh my gosh, this person who's gonna be my chair doesn't recognize what I've done, has no idea, and just makes you feel about this big, right? And, and, and that's just not right. That's just not right. So, I mean, it's those kind of things that you kind of learn to like shove off and, and push it back on them rather than internalizing that yourself. Yeah, it's always like the little subtle remarks that get to yeah. you, unfortunately. Um, I know like we, I, I'm going to backtrack a little, like Dr. Espy, would you, do you want to add anything on about how you got into neuroscience? Oh, sure, like, sure. Well, I, I'd be happy to. You know, <laughs> it's funny listening to Janice's story. I really resonate with the curiosity. I, I find most 
folks who are into science, into STEM generally, they're curious. They're curious about how the world works. They want to get their hands dirty and kind of think about that regardless of, you know, what field you're in. I myself credit my kind of inherent curiosity. I love reading Nancy Drew books. I loved like kind of thinking about the detective and figuring things out because that's kind of what you do as a scientist. I was always good at math and, you know, I like many thought that the way you would go about being a scientist was being a physician. So when I was in college, I trailed a physician for a summer and oh my God, it was the most boring experience ever. <laughs> I, I watched, I, I trailed around a pediatrician and I swear all they saw basically was kids who were a little out of control or ear infections. They looked in so many ears and I thought, oh, this would be a horrible so then I was kind of floundering for a little bit, like, what am I going to do if I don't want to be a physician, right? Because I thought that was the path. And I was really fortunate that I had a faculty member who introduced me to some basic work in neuroscience on kind of decision making. And that opened up a whole new area that I found in, in incredibly exciting. And then I went to graduate school and that's how I got there. You know, it, you found something that you really loved that piqued your curiosity that you wanted to dive in and learn more. Like that with librarianship too. So <laughs> I, I understand. Um, what about um, you two, uh, Dr. B and Dr. B. Gislin? Was it the same for you? Did you also come to science really early? So um, I can give you an example. When I was a kid, um, I used to really like how physics can help to solve your day-to-day -day little problems. So um, in India, we are a lot of right, uh, rice eaters. So uh, my mom always used to give me this hot plate of rice, right? So that's when my father used to figure out, uh, tell me, why don't you figure out how can you eat it instead of just complaining, like you increase the surface area, you reduce the temperature. These little things used to pick my curiosity. And uh, that's when I realized that uh, this, con this how we can, by understanding science, even from day-to-day -day little things to bigger things, you can get uh, an answer. So, so that's when I realized that I, I, it, it's the natural curiosity and the, the concept of being a scientist was very exciting to me at that point. And I think one point I just would like to add for everybody, I think the environment is very important. And especially for women, if you are around, uh, even at this point, is if your family is actively involved and are excited about what you do and uh, that makes a lot of difference. That's a general observation I have. I would, I feel like I'm just agreeing with and nodding to what everyone has said. Um, I'm enjoying hearing it. So I hope everybody's enjoying it. But I, I feel like there's a number of things that kind of stood out to me. One, um, I think Dr. Bush talked about being outside and playing. And I guess I've been thinking about that a lot because everyone's home and kids are on devices so much. And I had honestly never really thought about the role that being outside and playing so much in my childhood may have had on my interest in scientists and just the freedom to be curious and explore. And so I, I like that um, description of science or anything within you know the STEM professions as being curious. It's not about being better or smarter than everyone. And I think that can be the perception of people is that, you know, scientists and engineers are just smarter than everybody else. I think we're just more curious and more persistent and kind of stubborn and willing to keep asking questions. And we know how little we know. And, you know, we're not content to just take an answer and move on. So I like how different panelists said different parts of that. I feel like, yeah, that's, that's kind of where my interest came from as a child. And then I, I remember taking a chemistry class when I was about 14 and getting introduced to the essentials of the periodic table. And I just thought it was the most beautiful thing in the world. It was so amazing. The whole world could be made of, you know, a hundred, whatever it is these days, a hundred, however many kinds of atoms, but mostly like 20 ish. And they're simply distinguished by different numbers of protons. That was just the most magical thing I'd ever heard. So that still stands out to me. No, that's those are always really great things to always hear is like like how I was mentioned earlier with for Dr. Bush was like how do we like how does everything start how does that ball start and how do we decide to go on what path we want and um you know I, I would like to also just kind of hear from our panelists if they you know if you will share is kind of the same question I asked Dr. Espy 
um, you know, what were some challenges that you that, that you faced in the STEM field, and how are you able to overcome these obstacles and barriers in your in your own field of study? I can, um, if you want, I can quickly give you one of the other challenges which didn't come up is. Um, uh, I, I noticed that women are, we don't collaborate that much as, uh, as I see in the male colleagues, uh, my contemporaries. So that is, um, that sometimes uh, comes as a challenge and both in terms of uh, if there is an organic collaboration, it happens, but uh, going out of the way to make collaborations is something uh, I initially I saw thought that that was a big challenge. And then that comes due to various reasons. One is when we first join our, um, our career, many of us are really busy at home with, uh, with small children and other responsibilities. So at most of the time, it's like uh, you go do your job and come back. Whereas collaboration in uh, academia and STEM is very important part. And uh, due to either because of the time or because of the constraints and that is not that much, but uh, later on, I realized that once we get out of our natural way of working alone, it, it makes a lot of difference is one, uh, is one of the topics I just would like to bring up and maybe somebody has a similar experiences or something different. I'll just say briefly, uh, I, I will, I will follow what Dr. Espy said is just feel like I, even today, I still have to earn the respect, respect of male colleagues that somehow I'm seen differently. And um, so, you know, to overcome that, I think that you just have to show confidence and, and um, be able to express that confidence if need be. My husband tells the story of being on meetings over at the Health Science Center with physicians, and they will address their male colleagues as Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so, but the female physicians, they just use their first names. And I mean, and this is now, this is not something that happened 20 years ago. So I think it's, con and for me, I still get this imposter syndrome that will creep in, in spite of my experience, you know, and where I am. And I even had a, you know, a mentor tell me within the last month, you know, you can get the imposter syndrome too. You know, you've earned what you're doing and you need to own it. So even, even where I am in my career, I still feel that I, I have to deal with that and, and fight to, to, to maintain my confidence that I belong. It's probably, I guess it's that simple that you belong, right? Yeah, I would agree with what you're saying, Dr. Bush, what um, the others have said. I feel like the most um, kind of obvious or um, kind of explicit forms of like being seen differently or maybe as not as intelligent because I identified uh, as a female was when I was younger or early in my career or in grad school and, you know, in a very, very male dominated department, you know, they were young and dumb and hadn't had to deal with the professional world, build professional skills. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago. And it was in Seattle, which is a pretty enlightened place. And, you know, there's, I can think of plenty of um, vivid examples, which are not even, not necessarily G-rated of just things that are said or, you know, things that happen. It was very clear, you know, the male PhD science students or sometimes professors did not view the female students as intelligent or as capable sometimes. Some were great, some were not, but it, you know, it was part of the culture in a very male dominated department. And even things like, um, you know, say a group of people who researched together, everybody would go out, you know, have drinks, talk about their work, form collaborations perhaps, you know, some of the professors would go and when there's one or two female students, you know, everyone's drinking a lot. You don't feel comfortable drinking a ton when you then got to navigate your way home. They don't have to think twice about that. So I think even, you know, having to think about your safety in different ways, which, you know, all female college students think about that in maybe different ways than male college students, not necessarily, but tend to more often, you know, just little things like that can creep in. And when that happens, early in your career begins shaping the opportunities available to you. You know, you don't stay until two in the morning and feel totally comfortable drinking as much. You miss out on some of the opportunities or, 
if one male colleague says something, even if the other 10 don't agree with that or don't see it the same way, it's still shaped something about the culture or the environment. Um, kind of like Dr. Espy says, in ways that are, are small, just little incidences, little words, little comments in passing, um, but it starts to add up over time. And subconsciously, even how you see yourself can be affected. Um, so I certainly identify with that, just kind of the little comments at different times um, in different ways over the course of, you know, grad school or in a job you have, you know, I worked somewhere where a male colleague treated his male colleagues with respect and treated me like I was a teaching assistant, though I was an equal. And it just was how it was. And there wasn't a whole lot I could do about the situation. Like I could throw a big fit and like complain to someone, but it was really hard to not see myself as less than because that's how I was getting treated. But I could never, there wasn't much to put my finger on or do much about except to slowly try and, you know, build my own confidence even if the rest of the people in the department were fine. And so, yeah, I think, you know, little things show up in different ways. And again, just sometimes one person in their comments can um, kind of take root in ways that take a long time to overcome and can kind of lead to that imposter syndrome or lead to that sense of, um, yeah, just not being as intelligent or wondering if everyone else thinks you're not as smart or kind of second guessing yourself so that's kind of my, my long-winded answer to that question is it kind of shows up in different ways at different times. And Before we move, move from this though, I do want to say that we do have a lot of colleagues that say positive things and also encourage us. So yeah, so it goes both ways. So it, it, yes, so I just want to make sure that's clear. At least in my mind, I, I, I've had a lot of support. Yes, not at all to disagree with that. I think, again, where it's like one person, even if 50 people are positive, I think we all tend to remember the one person who's not, unfortunately. Yeah, just like course evaluations. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I guess we can switch over and um, take a more positive, go to a more positive direction. Um, what about like rewarding moments, like in like your career, like in the work you've done. I'm gonna go ahead and direct this at you, Dr. B. <laughs> you, you can take it first. <laughs> okay, I'll start and others can pitch in. So, uh, well, in terms of rewarding moment, I think um, I've been in this uh, uh, profession for quite some time. So now I have uh, a lot of uh, students who have graduated, who have completed. So one of the big rewards is to see them grow and be in, in that positions where they are able to handle uh, their research very independently. So this comes across different grades, uh, especially with graduate students, you sit and work with them, sometimes even weekends, and uh, families get to know each other. There's a very strong bond that forms. So when they graduate, they leave, and then you see them after a few years uh, do so well in the career, it's extremely satisfying. So that is uh, one of the advantages of, uh, of being in academia is that you have this teaching where you, you teach a class and um, from these undergraduates uh, whom you, some of them, you really have to groom handheld and groom them. It's, it's very nice to see that they are continuing their career in that path. And, uh, and then there are these graduate students whom you work so closely for multiple years and then you see them uh, doing so well in that area and they pretty much resonate your philosophy of thinking research and that's really satisfying then comes of course your uh, satisfaction in research is uh, um, in, in i was fortunate that i was able to work with some uh, 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 good projects with working with us army us Na navy and uh, we had like, a few eureka moments in our group which uh, which keeps me going a lot. It, it, it excites me a lot. And, uh, and so together we work so, so many hours, weekends and years. And at the end of it, we have that Eureka moment. I think that is something which we look forward for that. So then, um, and last but not the least is the, is the relationships. Is, um, as I said before, when I came, I was just a, a graduate student with absolutely no, no family or anybody when I came to US, but now, 
uh, all these members, my colleagues, the students, they all have become an extended family. So every year I go to conferences, it's like attending a family wedding. So that is why I, I hardly attend the talks. It's for the, uh, the other things that I go for this. So that I feel is a big reward. So in the, in the, in the almost close to two decades that I have been in, in US, I have formed this big close family. I think that that was a big reward I have right now. So yeah, I'll just second with, you know, my, the biggest reward is the success of the students. And, you know, I have students all over the United States doing great things and in great places and, you know, rising up higher than I am now. So that's, and that's what we want. Um, but also I want to add, you know, being a role model for other women. And I've taken that, I, I've seen that more as being very important over the last probably 15 years. I didn't really think about it so much early on. But uh, uh, having that, and I went back and I counted how many female professors I had in my STEM courses. So I had three when I was an undergraduate, three female faculty members uh, in a class. For my master's degree, I didn't have any. And for my doctorate, I didn't have any. And um, so I realized that it is important um, to, to be a role model for the, the women. So that's big for me. Dr. Espy and Dr. Vikasling, do you want to add anything on to that? <laughs> so I, I love the Eureka moment, right? Because I think that's the rewarding part that links back to the curiosity, right? Is each of us in our own fields, it's like, wow, it worked. And it, <laughs> look what we learned. And oftentimes that thing you learn is a little different than what you thought, or it may be kind of the same, but then it projects a new direction that then just sets off the next cascade of what you're going to investigate or make or... And that's what's really so exciting. And I too echo with the sense of where my students are. And it's interesting because it's not only those that stayed in your field, right? It's also those who write you who have gone off in a totally different direction and say, I remember working with you and it taught me this, that, or the other thing that now I use in my career as an attorney or as a whatever. So, I mean, you have radiating impacts in ways that are beyond just your own area and beyond the academy as well. We'll go on to the next question, and if anything, we can have time later, we'll circle back around. Um, uh, uh, Diane, you want to ask the next yeah. question? Um, so this question is for Dr. Vixen, um, or Vixen. Um, what advice would you give to women who, who, who are considering a future in STEM? I think, you know, there's lots of different ways to answer that, but I tried to come up with just a few, um, kind of a a short few thoughts. Um, I think a big one for anyone in any field really is to decide what you value most and to be okay with that. Um, to not let the one out of 50 negative voices shake you from what you know you want. And sometimes it takes some sort of quiet or listening to wise voices to kind of know who you are and what you want. And that evolves over time and you figure it out as you try different things. Um, but to any student, no matter how they identify, I would say, you know, listen to wise voices, listen to good mentors, try to find good people to work with, but don't, don't let anyone else determine your value or shape who you should be, which is really difficult. I think that's a kind of a lifelong struggle. Um, Dr. Espy's story about the colleague who said, well, who's with the children? Um, I, you know, I can see how that kind of comment could really, you know, there's a lot behind that and it can land in a lot of different ways. And it kind of, you know, who knows how it's meant, but something like that can really shape the sense of, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? And everyone's gonna have a different opinion of what you should do. And, you know, I took some time where I kind of, I didn't totally take time off, but I worked part-time. I didn't go the route a lot of my friends did. And I had some voices in my life who were like, good for you, you're with your child more. And other people, maybe not directly, but indirectly are kind of like, what a waste. You have a PhD and you're spending time with your child when the world needs you. And especially, um, I just got some weird things got said to me in that stage of life. And, uh, you know, you have to decide for yourself what you value. and um, hold on to that because everyone is going to have their opinion and you're never going to make everybody happy. And 
I know that has been a process for me. And you can, you know, listen to the constructive criticism, but try not to, to take on that criticism because it will come and sometimes directly or indirectly, people will feel more comfortable saying things to someone who, you know, is different than the majority of the people in the room. It's, you know, something in human nature, it's more comfortable and it's safer and it's more okay to do that. So whoever you are, and if you're, whenever you're in a room where you're not the majority for whatever reason, um, you know, just, just, you know, listen and, and don't take it on as your identity. Um, the other thing I was gonna say is, you all have probably like read studies on how women apologize more. And this is a small thing, but just, I remember reading that and realizing how often I say, sorry, but, or even kind of a, a faintly apologetic tone and to like, just keep track of when you say sorry and try not to. Um, as a female, you don't have to apologize any more than a male colleague, unless you know, you've done something wrong then make it right and move on. So for me, that was a big piece of advice that shapes how I approach a conversation where um, maybe I feel like I have to work to be heard. And um, I think ultimately, like my advice to a student in STEM, any student in STEM is just to be curious, to persevere. You don't have to be the smartest. You don't have to be the best. Again, um, it's about just being curious and trying to learn no matter who you are, what you look like, what other people think of you. Um, if you're curious and you're willing to stick with it, like you can go places within STEM, regardless of what anyone else says or what they think, um, the different challenges you'll all have to face. So stay with it, stay with it. I would love to hear from our other panelists, you know, just advice that you could give us um, as we are going through our, our educational and career journey and making it, you know, day by day. Well, I could maybe just uh, start and um, pass it on to the others. Uh, uh, one thing I would say is um, as a student, everything is a mathematical equation, right? So you study hard, you get good grades. But um, as you join a job, you see that uh, things are not exactly like a mathematical equation. If you, if, if you are good, it's not like you get a high pay, you get a promotion. It doesn't happen, these things. So and at the same time, uh, women and uh, everybody, they also have an additional challenges. Because uh, most of the time people have a specific perceptions in your mind. This is how a doctor should look like. This is how a professor should look like. This is how a mechanical engineer should look like. Or, and even within faculty, uh, a biology faculty is different from someone who's teaching uh, a mechanical engineering, right? So with all these perceptions, uh, Everybody is human. So uh, it's going to be a lot of human element involved. And sometimes uh, these things might not come as positive and negative, but one thing which uh, I sincerely believe in, which will help is don't take it on your job or what you are doing. So irrespective of what things are around you, that perfection and excellence should be delivered because at some point you will be rewarded. <laughs> so maybe not at that minute, not at that day, or maybe not in that and but even if you're not rewarded at least personally you feel extremely satisfied i think uh, in the end that's what matters and that's what i personally think is um, is uh, taking any of these uh, other external factors into into our work and especially for women one of the challenge comes is it's a balance between family and time and uh, you tend to sacrifice something at home and you do something at work and if that is not coming out positive it might be even more uh, hurtful. So, but uh, putting all those things aside, you still do an excellence in your job. I think in the long run, it's going to pay off somehow. So that's my two cents for that. Now, I'll talk a minute about it. For me, it's kind of a, it's, it's actually the, probably the hardest question is what advice, because I try to do it individually on where, try to meet the student where they are or the woman where they are. and but. Um, I will say that I, I tell them that getting, a, I just talked to our graduate students last night, the new graduate students coming in for this semester and, and that getting a, a, a degree in STEM is, is a huge accomplishment. When you look at the number of people that even get degrees and then narrow it down to STEM and these were master students and that. So it's, it's a big deal to get it. That means it's, you know, it's hard work. <laughs> so it does take a lot of work. 
I want to make sure that they know that, but also the balance. You you have to have a balanced life or you won't be successful. So you have to manage manage both of those. You know, it's going to be a lot of work to be a uh, be in STEM, um, but uh, make sure that you balance those requirements to be successful in, in your profession or in a STEM discipline with your personal life. So that's kind of what I would, I would say. Yeah, I guess I would echo everything that's been said earlier, but also add that I think something that's being open, you know, life has a way of taking you in different directions and presenting you with different sets of experiences and different phases of your life, you have different competing pressures. And sometimes it really is a, a long game, right? So you may make trade-offs at one point in time that then have a different advantage later on. And I, you know, early in my career, I worked on these two studies, for example, that like everyone said, why are you working on this weird genetic study? And, and, and it was just, I was really curious. I thought it was kind of interesting. And sure enough, later on, I learned these techniques that then I used in a study of my own, right? And it's not like at the beginning I said, oh, I'm going to be so smart and go work on this study that then will help me propel this blah, blah, blah. No, it's just, I was open to like, wow, this is kind of neat, right? And then it has a way of coming back together. So I, I do think, you know, being true to yourself and your own values about what you value at any particular time, but having the faith that it will then pay it forward in a way to result in success. Because it is, it's a long game. It's not a short you know, I love that. Um, I, I really think if there's something you're curious about or super enthusiastic or passionate about, you can, it's much easier to succeed um, in, in those projects specifically. Uh, at least that's the case for me. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go ahead and open up um, the questions. Like, uh, sorry, open up for Q&A right now. So if you have any questions, feel free to paste it into the chat and um, Esteban will gather them and send it to us. I'm gonna go ahead and ask this question that came in from the audience like before the panel actually, while we're waiting for more questions to come. So this um, is just for anybody, anyone, any of you can answer it. But I, I'm just curious, like all of you are at different, um, like different points in your career right now. And I was wondering if you had like any advice um, for women about obtaining leadership roles like was that challenging for all of you and um, like do you have any advice for like the audience on how to be a good leader and like assert your leadership in the field okay i'll start it <laughs> i'll break the silence here so i never considered myself a leadership uh a leader type because i was kind of shy and i figured a leader could can't really be shy uh, but, you know, just through experience and, you know, being, being put on committees and then, then you're chair of a committee, you, you kind of gradually learn that. And, and I did the leadership UTSA, the dean had nominated me way back. And after completing that year course, then I realized they're all different kinds of leaders. Yeah, and so it's not one personality type. And so you can grow into it for sure, I guess is what I would say if you have doubts about it. Um, and the more experience you get, watch the good leaders, see what they do and make note of that. And then when you're in the leadership role, try to do the same thing. That's kind of how I did it anyway. Yeah, I'd like to echo what Janice said. Um, you know, you find yourself in roles and people putting you on things. And then suddenly I, I too did a women's internship that was meant to develop skills like that. And I found it incredibly valuable. A lot of us in the academy are shy, right? We tend to be a little bit more on the introspective um, side of things and don't necessarily think of that as a quality, again, because people tend to think of more genderized or, or male ways of being. And yet, in fact, uh, you know, studies generally show that women are outstanding leaders. They tend to be very good team builders. They tend to be very sensitive to differences of opinion and help move towards consensus, which is really important relative to um, advancing anyone's goals. So I think those kind of leadership experiences where you can try it on and see if that's something that you find um, exciting. For me, I didn't start my career saying, ooh, I want to be a provost. I mean, you kind of be worried about people like that, you know? Um, but you find like at, at a certain point in your career, you begin to have as much satisfaction and interest and curiosity about contributing to the success of others that's in a different way than just your own career. And so for me at this point in my career, I find that incredibly um, rewarding because I want to make sure UTSA is the best academic environment it can be for our faculty, for our students, and for our staff. 
thank you for those that advice. And we have um, we have an audience question that came into us. Um, so one of our participants would like to ask is after getting your degree, how did you narrow down what profession or career you wanted? So I can maybe start with that. I think one advice uh, uh, which I give to many students is internships are really good opportunities to know what's going on because uh, they're, uh, what government does versus what industry does versus what happens in academia, all these things are a very different ball games. So the best thing to do is, uh, is participate in multiple internships across and it can be paid, it can be voluntary, it can be a week long, it can be anything. So for me, that mattered a lot because while I was doing my master's and uh, it was, uh, I was doing a master's in mechanical and aerospace program, we had a lot of opportunities to either join Boeing and Lockheed Martin or move on to the PhD. So I think that pros and cons is one is, um, of course, when soon as you take a job right after master's, you feel good as a sudden paycheck that comes. And then you move on to your PhDs where um, you pretty much are with that end-to-end uh, uh, -end meeting the balances, the checkbook sort of things. So I think that's the advice I would give is uh, internship. And the other thing is also which help is uh, trying to interact with uh, people across and understanding what that career is. And, uh, and then you realize, hey, I think I don't want to work under someone all the time, or I like to do more of teaching, or I just want to work with people who are my same caliber. So these are all the decisions which will help you to decide which sector to go. All right, thank you. Um, and if anyone has anything to add, we can, I guess, come back to that if we have time. But I wanted to ask this question. It actually came in before the panel too, but um, there's an audience question about, um, was there a time where you had to negotiate a position or salary when you were applying for a job in the field? And if so, how did you deal with it? And what was the outcome? I think that would be useful for everyone in our audience. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> Any job you take, you typically are negotiating a salary. And what I would say first is do your homework, because obviously salaries vary tremendously, even for the same job relative to what part of the country. So you'd, you, know, women tend to undervalue what that salary would be. So don't be frightened to come up with something reasonable and then have the reasons why, right? Um, and, and then you have a period of negotiation. Don't be a jerk and go too long, but don't undervalue yourself and take something that, that wouldn't, you know, that isn't in keeping with your, with your skills. I don't really, I don't really have anything to add. It's just, um, it, that, that's, a, that's probably the toughest, toughest thing for me <laughs> is negotiating. Uh, and, you know, especially, I think, my whole career in academia, it's always been the budget, the budget, the budget. I was like, you know, well, if I'm going to get a, you know, if I'm going to negotiate for a salary, even though it may be the appropriate salary, you know, who's not going to get the money below me or whatnot. So it's, uh, it's tough. Uh, that's all I can say. So I don't have anything to add. No, and that's, it's very true. It's such a hard thing. Like, but I, you know, and I remember this is conversation I had with so many friends, you know, female friends, it's like that aspect of negotiation and that, you know, overcoming that fear of negotiating our, you know, our time and our compensation and everything that we bring to the table. Um, we do have, an, uh, I mean, unless uh, Dr. B or Dr. V, if you guys have anything to add to, you know, the aspect of, you know, approaching negotiation how should we you know approach as women are negotiating and how we should be compensated <laughs> well i think we're fine there's a few more questions if you'd like to go ahead and okay um so uh, we do have an audience question is what advice do you have for women to uplift each other rather than feeling like they are pitted um pit, we're put against each other um, or feeling the need to be independent. And quite frankly, I've never been put in that situation. So fortunately, I've never, never felt that and never been in that situation. I think for anyone, um, regardless of who they are, just getting to know them as human beings, which seems like very obvious, but um, I have, not here. My boss, UTSA, is amazing as a female. 
um, best boss I've ever had. But previously, my more difficult supervisors were the women. Um, previous male supervisors were very supportive. And, you know, that was a tricky relationship. And I found then, um, or at any job, the more you just realize everyone is a person and has their difficulties and kind of the more difficult someone is or the more they've got to cut people down or the more they have this effect on you of making you feel less than, it really is about them, not you. And they're probably making everyone feel that way, not just you, even though it feels that way. So I think, you know, just keeping those things in mind can be really helpful. Sometimes this comes up respect, with respect to people's individual choices about family and, you know, the intersection yeah. of having children versus not and, and that, and, and that can be particularly challenging. But being mindful of everyone has individual choices and most folks have responsibilities in their personal life, be it your children, your aged parents, people you care about next door, your pets, I mean, you name it. And, you know, people make individual choices that should be respected and valued. So we're down to our last uh, five minutes. So I'm going to just go ahead and ask everybody if um, you have like any final parting words for the audience. I know like you can see some of the questions like we haven't been able to get to. So if you want to address one of those, like, you can definitely do that as well. Well, maybe I'll, I'll start. It's really great, these kind of events, you know, that really share people's feelings and insights that I think makes you feel like you're not alone. I find it remarkable some of the same things that I thought in graduate school that I think now still, you know, it's something fundamental across our, our workforce, but it really does help kind of demystify and, and make those feelings normal, I guess, in some ways. And that's what builds collegiality. That's what builds a sense of we all belong. So thank you all for putting this on and these kind of things, because I think they go a long way towards building that positive collegial spirit that we're talking about. I'd also say, I know that we're all very, very busy, but you know, if you, you're seeking a female mentor, it's all right to ask people. If they can do it, they, they will. And if they're too busy, you know, it, that's fine as well. But it's all right to seek out, um, you know, and it may be just a one or two visits to talk about experiences, you know, or it, or it could become a lifelong mentorship. So don't be afraid to ask. And um, we've all been taught to say no if we have to. So. So I would like to say a few words as uh, it's it, communication is the key in most of the times and um, anytime you feel uh, something is not the way you want to go, communication is there. And I can tell you from lot of ex from my experience, there are a lot of people who would like to help and who want who are who are empathetic. It is not um, a very cruel and harsh world out there. And <laughs> because there are people across different sectors uh, and um, and they see what's going on and, uh, and that empathy is there. On the other hand, there are a few people who don't see the other point of viewpoint. And um, one simple example is I have seen colleagues who's, uh, uh, who's neither their, their spouses or their mother or sisters or daughters, they, they have no experiences. So that is why they are where they are. So that's my personal take on that. And so communication is generally the answer for most of the, the issues. All right, thank you. Um, well, this has been great. And just uh, Dr. B. Kislin, do you want to add anything on right before we go? Um, no, I put something in the chat. I saw a bunch of questions, which totally makes sense as you're all college students, just thinking about some of the practical things about um, internships and majors and fields. Um, I teach AIS here, which is a class where we spend a bunch of time talking about those things, but we don't necessarily get too much farther than what you talked about freshman year. So I'm happy to talk with any of you about that. And I put my email address in the chat if you'd like to just connect and have a chance to process where you're at or what you're thinking about or what opportunities might be. So just want to acknowledge those. I know there was maybe five of those questions and so. Oh, thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, like, I think the students would appreciate that. Yeah, the students are appreciating that you guys are sharing your stories and you know your experiences with us. Um, and like we just, I we just want to say thank you for taking the time um, and the emotional energy to do this. And you know, just 
you guys are paving the path for us to continue doing what we want to do and we're eternally grateful thank you thank you for putting it on it's been very <laughs> very nice experience I appreciate it thank you we, uh, we enjoyed it a lot so thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, and of course, if, um, if there are specific questions in the chat box that we didn't have a chance to answer, um, we will be collecting these questions and um, hopefully we'll be able to share and distribute these questions with our panelists and they could, um, you know, supply an answer um, in the future and we will have that available for you guys. Um, any last words, Amy? Um, just saying that we did record this, so we will upload it to our UTSA Libraries channel um, sooner or later, <laughs> uh, hopefully <laughs> sooner, um, and we will share the recording with everybody who is registered for the event, and thank you again to um, our faculty. You guys were awesome and mm -hmm. had a lot of fun today, and I, I think I, I learned a lot, so thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs> thank you all.